welcome to the second evening of Science Gallery Bengaluru's online exhibition, Phytopia. Welcome, a special welcome to Gabriela Sotolaviaga, a colleague and, and a professor at the University of Harvard. Allow me to introduce to you Phytopia. It's our first online and third exhibition since we started programming last October. This time, as we did with Submerge, our earlier exhibition, we are also partnering with the BIC. A quick word for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Science Gallery Bengaluru is established in partnership with the Indian Institute of Science, National Center for Biological Sciences, and Trishti Institute of Art, Technology, and Design. We are a part of an international network of galleries with seven other galleries across the world. And in India, we are established with funding primarily from the government of Karnataka. We would love for you to complete feedback forms once you have had the opportunity to listen to us and had the opportunity also to see the exhibition. Today, you can post your questions in the question and answer box. I'll take now the opportunity to introduce our speaker today, Gabriela Sotolaviaga. She's a professor of history of science and the Antonio Madero professor for the study of Mexico at Harvard University. She specializes in modern Latin America. Her first book, Jungle Laboratories, Mexican Peasants, National Projects and the Making of the Pill, won the Robert Merton Best Book Prize in Science, Knowledge and Technology Studies from the American Sociological Association. She's working on a second monograph, which is almost about to come out, on the role of healthcare providers, in Mexico. It's her latest book project that excites us all because it seeks to re-narrate the histories of 20th century agricultural development aid from the point of view of India and Mexico, the talk that you just were hearing. Gabriela is at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for this academic year and so we are happy, very, very happy for her to join us this time and give us, you know, a wonderful peek into her work, uh, which involves India and Mexico, and the intriguing and wonderful figure of Pandurang Khan Koje. So Gabriela, thank you very much for the talk. I will take the opportunity to, to ask you a couple of questions to begin with, following which we will open the session to our audience and get them to ask you questions as well. So the very first question is, what took you to this study. So what about Khan Koje drew you to it? Or what, what in fact even took you to Khan Koje at all? And, uh, and when? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, before I, I answer, I want to say what a great honor it is for me to be joining you in my morning, your night. And I, I want to say that with Phytopia and with the Bengaluru uh, Center, I think it's amazing, the innovation from the ground up and what an amazing opportunity. And I really feel truly uh, enthusiastic and honored to be a part of this. So thank you for the invitation. So to answer your question, um, what took me to the study? What took me to Kankoje? So I, I think it's a two part question. Um, my initial project began as a question of nutrition. In the early 1940s, there was this debate in Mexico about races. Um, and which racial hierarchy was more important or stronger. And one of the studies was to determine if indigenous people, if they were quote unquote backward because of what they ate. It was a question of nutrition. It was a racist ideology couched within this terms of science. So these nutritional studies began and, and I thought, oh, this will be my next book project. But then when I began to read, I realized it wasn't so much a question of nutrition, but it's a question of what they considered to be the right crop. And the right crop was not corn, the Mexico, the land of corn, but it was wheat, which was this European import, which had suddenly, at, in the mid 20th century, become this notion of advancement. And it was this attempt to try to change nutritional uh, consumption, what people were eating, because they believed that what they ate could make them more advanced. This completely shocked me. So when I began to think more about wheat, then I realized that Mexico is one of 
the leading exporters of wheat seeds to the world. 70% of, of the wheats planted in wheat seeds or strains planted around the world today all emerge from one laboratory center in, Mex in, no in northern Mexico. Again, this was, a, this was a, a, a data that shocked me. And the more I began to look into this, I stumbled across this book. Um, and it was written by Savrita Sani, whose pictures I know she has uh, lent for your exhibit. And she wrote this extraordinary book, uh, I Shall Never Ask for Pardon. And it is the biography of her father, uh, Panduran Kankoje. And it begins with his time in India, but then his really, it's almost an odyssey. It's like reading a Greek legend, um, how he travels across the world and how he ends up in the Americas. First in California, he's part of the Gadar, the Gadar movement, but then he makes his way to Mexico. And in following Kankoje's, when I realized this isn't a story about Mexico and nutrition. It's a story about the exchange of knowledge between Mexico and India. And that we have been telling the history of the Green Revolution wrong. Because we have been focusing on the United States. We have been focusing on American scientists and American agronomists. And while that, that's pivotal, what was more important were the Indian scientists and the Mexican scientists who were making these seeds their own and in their own societies. Wonderful. This is this. I'm fairly certain. I mean, as, as you're aware, I'm a historian of science myself. You know, I've studied in India and, and then later, you know, our paths crossed in other places. But I myself encountered Khan Koji much later in life, you know. Mm. Um, and, and so it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually news to many Indians that at the root of the, the research that went into what made the Green Revolution possible, is the collaboration between Mexican scientists and an Indian scientist who, who sort of wandered his way into Mexico, uh, becoming yes. incredibly good friends with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, who even painted a, a, a mural for him, etc. Yes. From, from your eyes, could you take a couple of moments to tell us a little bit more about Khan Koje and how he looks through your eyes? You know, as as a, as a person, because you know, there is there is the story of him in India before he reaches the Americas. And then there's the story of him in Mexico, you know, with a vibrant cultural and political scene. And then, of course, his return to India after that. Yeah. So from a personal point of view, yes, he's an extraordinary individual. When you think of all he had to do to, number one, get to the Americas, it's really extraordinary. There's one passage in particular that... Um, I think really summarizes the type of individual he was and the persona that he had. When he was in California, um, he arrived with very little social network or support. And um, there were times when there was no money, where he was unable to eat. And mm -hmm. it, he begins to go to the nearby, so Central California, as many of you might know, is this is the one of the bread baskets of the world. So there are agricultural farms, and it is there where he meets migrant workers, where he himself would go initially, um, a seeking labor because what are you going to do at this time in in the early teens in San Francisco, which had recently been ravaged by the earthquake. I mean, there's all of of these um, different paths that are crossing. And I think he has a several qualities which I deeply admire. One, he was a go-getter. <laughs> this, this man, no obstacle was going to stop him. Not the ability to speak Spanish, because when he arrives in Mexico as a professor, he does yeah. not speak Spanish, which is remarkable. So, he, he's, so he's a go-getter, incredibly ambitious, because mm. he's able to bring himself up. But what is one of the through lines throughout is his immense love for the land that he has been forced to leave behind. Hmm. So he's constantly trying to get back to India. And in the archives, I find these letters, which are really emotional, where he's trying to uh, convince Indian authorities, as, as you may know, to let him come back, when, especially right after in Indian independence. And at the same time, he is a foreigner in Mexico. He is an immigrant in Mexico. 
So in the Mexican archives, what I'm finding are petitions for him to be able to stay longer in Mexico that are mm -hmm. constantly being granted. And as with most uh, immigrants or migrants, papers are really important to him because this is what gives him uh, legitimacy, validity in this world in which he's navigating. Mm -hmm. um, also, he, he really immerses himself in Mexican culture. And as, as someone who comes from Mexico, he begins, myself, uh, in Cancoje, I see the affinity that he felt for Mexico is what I feel for India. So there's also, he's able to see these connections and really root himself. Mm -hmm. So, and also, he's incredibly smart. You have to be very, very nimble intellectually to be able to do the many jobs that he did. He's involved with the Mexican Railroad Company. He's involved with steroid hormone production. If you put any of the key points in Mexican history for about 20 years, Kankuji is there. I mean, he's, he's there, as you mentioned, with this uh, artistic uh, elite, Diego Rivera, with Frida Kahlo, with Tina Modotti. Th this is an incredible cultural sphere, but he's also part of, a, a, he's very well connected with the Mexican political elite. So here's someone who's also a, an amazing diplomat. Um, as I said, I have great admiration for him as an individual, and it speaks very highly of, I think, in this time, especially right now in the United States, where there's so much backlash against immigrants and migrants, I think the tenacity that he portrays is something that many migrants and immigrants show when they arrive in a country, and they're the ones who bring up with their labor and their innovation and their creativity, they bring up society. It's quite incredible to to hear to hear in your words the story of a, of a man you know who who left India and and uh, of course not of not of his own volition but uh, because of political reasons as a co-founder of the Gadar Party, um, yes. where the British would have wanted to arrest him, he and several of his colleagues then find their way to uh, Mexico and, and uh, in a story that you so beautifully narrated, uh, just a little bit about his time in the United States. Uh, do I remember correctly that he 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 educated himself there, or what was what he, what did what did he kind of yeah what did he gain there? So he initially went to um, Berkeley, to the University of California at Berkeley, and mm -hmm. Berkeley had this agricultural program. So he begins his studies there, but then he also um, goes a bit further north, and he also um, he gets a degree from the University of Oregon. So. Mm -hmm. He, um, again, very well connected. And a lot of it had to do with the ability to pay where he was, where he, he was a student. And again, though there was a significant Indian population in San Francisco. And um, curiously, um, there is a, a very large Punjabi population in California at this time. Mm -hmm. And just as an aside, there's this wonderful book about Punjabi Mexicans because the, those who came, the Punjabi, it was all men who were coming initially to work in the fields and then they created their own businesses. And when they arrive, they realize that the women who look most like them are Mexicans. So there is this significant Punjabi Mexican population okay. in, uh, in California. So there is, uh, uh, in California, Indians from various regions. So he's able to make those networks, but still in terms of education, he's financing this on his own. Hmm. Which is, which is, uh, which is truly expensive, uh, impressive, but also impressive. It, it, you know, it reminds us of how in the early half of the 20th century, Berkeley was a place for many, yes. many to take refuge. And in my own work, for example, um, the physicist Bernard Peters, who oh, yes. escaped from Dachau, uh, from a from a from a concentration camp in Germany, found his way also to Berkeley and then studied with Robert Oppenheimer among other people. Mm. But but curiously enough, in the 1950s under the McCarthy era, when um, he you know as as sort of a left leaning Berkeley person who had escaped uh, escaped Dachau for being left leaning, um, he of course came under attack, and that's when he found himself in India. And then he lived here for over a decade and then, you know, finally went to De Denmark where he headed the Danish Atomic Energy Commission uh, and, and his family still lives there. 
so it, it, it and the circle kind of came ridiculously close when uh, uh, i found myself asking a student called alexandra peters in my classroom you know oh you're coming from denmark would you know ha 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 and as it turned out she was his granddaughter which was which was yeah. sort of a wonderful moment but coming back to berkeley and you know the the that it was a place of refuge for many people for political and other reasons which would explain why for example kankoji would find himself in berkeley Absolutely. among the first places to go to so coming coming back to plants which is what has brought us together uh, this time um you know so kankoji's experiments i mean among the beautiful beautiful image that you know modotti takes of his experiments he's working on corn right and an incredible sort of you know beautiful images but also incredible work on corn but would you be able to say a little more about the free agricultural schools that he set up together with mexican colleagues and yeah. you know, what what that what all that stood for and you know in a sense how it belongs in the history of farming and the relationship between between experiment and farming right like experimental stations yeah. and farming yeah so i think this is where stories where my interests really came together when we begin mm-hmm. to think about for example the free schools of agriculture yeah. so um uh, when kankoji arrives in mexico mexico has a very protracted and bloody revolution that mm-hmm. lasts from 1910 until 1917 and kankoji will arrive a few years later to Mexico but the country is still in political turmoil there it's still remaking itself after nearly a decade so one of the goals of um the Mexican revolution number one is to get land for the landless to break up the large estates education water i mean these these basic tenets and when kankoji arrives he sees many similarities with what he saw the british raj and the oppression of colonialism and the oppression of a political system in mexico that had favored the wealthy the large estates and had repressed and um really subjugated the farming class mm-hmm. and that's what leads to the revolution so when he is a uh, when he's at the national school of agriculture which is training the agronomist of the future with these revolutionary ideas he really finds a home right mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he arrives just in the fervent that's still happening with the revolution and many of those who are going to bring this change are those who are being educated as scientists of agriculture scientists of the land of the fields who are then going to take that knowledge to farmers mm-hmm. but he's seeing that that is not enough so that might be wonderful if you're close to an experimental station that might be fantastic if you're in the proximity of a school but what happens if you are not or what happens if uh in mexico there are over 60 languages spoken and spanish is just one so mm-hmm. what happens if the language of instruction is spanish and not these indigenous languages mm-hmm. so he comes up with this idea again in this fervent of of change that they're going to create free schools of agriculture so that regardless of your ability to pay or not we go back to this thing the ability to pay for education yeah, yeah, yeah. that if you are a farmer you can attend and this again goes to his ability to bring people together i'm not certain how he was able to gather money <laughs> to create these these initiatives but the photos that we have from Tina Modotti um that Savitri Soni thankfully saved and they're now real treasures um Absolutely. and they they show us these farmers in these rural landscapes in these makeshift schools and um in the newspapers you begin to see in the early 1920s in farming competitions that members of these free schools are winning their crops because they're the bigger lusher crops so when they begin to win these crop competitions hmm. and uh so with these free schools it's bringing together this fervor that he had for revolution for overthrowing um the empire and he finds a home in mexico and what you have is these peasant organizations that are writing to him and curiously some of these writings um are found in new delhi not in mexico because mm-hmm. he saved them and um again savitri soni donated them uh to the Timurti in in Delhi yes. and they're housed in that archive and it's this correspondence between peasant leagues in Mexico who are asking 
that they create a, a school in their, in their village. Um, and so you begin to see the impact of these schools that were very modest from the outside. But if there was no school in your proximity and you suddenly have one, and what the teaching goal is about making you independent of middlemen, hmm. very, of creating your farm, farm space, of creating better crops, for your profit and the profit of your community, not for the profit of, of just capital and to create this different mindset. And uh, just very fine, um, quickly, and experimental stations were crucial for this. And Kankoje says every farm, every in everyone's backyard is a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Everything is an experimental station. So to ferment this idea of, of creativity, of, of everyone can innovate, you don't have to be a scientist. And I love that. I love this, this idea that all farmers who had been um, put down for, for centuries had suddenly, you know, you can be a scientist. You can, you can research. Um, so I think the schools of, uh, the free schools of agriculture, unfortunately, did not survive for that long. They were part of this move where so many initiatives were, were, take, were being taken on, but there's also a lot of political movement and they don't survive the political movement. Hmm. So this is, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's again, you know, um, sort of today's probably the day of bringing things, um, you know, circularly to, to uh, you know, to, to kind of round up, to, to close. Because uh, in India, the, the emergence of Mohandas Gandhi as a leader, as a leader of the, of the freedom movement also begins uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a protest by indigo farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the first satyagraha in Champaran, which he, which he goes and leads at the invitation of the farmers uh, because of, of course, the rise of German aniline dyes and therefore the decline in indigo trade globally, which leads to um, lots of extent, uh, you know, so, so they, they set up experimental stations, like you said, you know, uh, for bettering the quality of natural indigo, that doesn't go very well, leads to decline in profits because commercially indigo is no longer being sold and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible story on its own, one that, you know, our, some of our colleagues have, of course, written about. But in, in, in light of the Khan Kode story, it also becomes interesting that, you know, that, that uh, in effect, peasant rebellions can work in different ways, right? Or peasant Absolutely. revolt or protest can work in different ways. And, and, and that's, that's an inseparable story from the story of crops and therefore plants. Um, so uh, I will move on to allow other, I mean, I could talk to you forever. Uh, and, you know, uh, but I think let's, let's also give, um, you know, uh, the chance to, uh, to some others to also ask us questions. So uh, there's one question uh, Nityanand wants to ask, you, which is that one of the elements of the conventional narrative of the Green Revolution is the PL 480 program. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk about where it's where it fits in this picture that you've just talked about? Yes, um, thank you for that question. And it's okay. So the PL 480 program, for those of you who may not be fam familiar, it was part of this food aid narrative, part of the uh, a, a loan to provide uh, food. So when, um, when the Indian uh, community decides that they're not going to go, there's this debate because for the PL 480, that would create another dependency or another type of uh, financial dependency on the United States for a country that had just become independent. Hmm. So when, um, and India is looking for other solutions other than uh, attaining a loan. And it is in part because of these, uh, this search for other solutions that you have, for example, Brazil offers to send it wheat as well, as long as India can pay for, um, for the transport. The, the problem with the PL480 uh, is that they would not accept payment in rupees. It had to be uh, um, changed to dollars, which was a, a, a terrible, if you looked at the long run, this was not a good deal <laughs> in any situation. So it's within the, and this is where Mexico really understands and inserts itself. Mexico that has long had a tradition of being subjugated by loans. 
especially when it um when it's attempting to create a financial independence so it's in this aftermath of these negotiations for the PL480 that you see this negotiation of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Mexican government that both come together and begin to send the seed to India. So from my perspective, the PL480 is one of the propellers that launches what would then become the Green Revolution because it's the attempt to look for other solutions that aren't uh, created by the the need for a loan that would then uh, have strapped India in a very difficult situation. But also um, India as a nation, strategically, geographically, as we know, was coveted by, in this time, the, the Cold War, by the two powers. So India is really in, in a really good negotiating position, if we want to call it that, because of its geography, because of where it's located and what it meant for the Soviet Union and what it meant for the United States. And despite that, you know, P PL480, they weren't necessarily the greatest of terms for a country that needed aid at that moment. Hmm. Right. Um, and yet, you know, I mean, in a sense, so I think, and of course, then the wheat story plays out. I mean, PL480, of course, sends yeah. India, uh, you know, uh, uh, wheat and, and uh, among, among the other sort of stories that is known of the PL480, and I, I, maybe you've picked this up, Gabriel, already on your journeys to India. There's a certain weed that came with um, an American weed. It's a grass um, that came with the wheat. And because the wheat came under the regime of the Indian National Congress at that point of time, or that, or that they were in power, the grass came to be called as Congress grass. And I, I uh, hope someday somebody writes the story of, of, of you know, these uh, species that in effect came with aid and, you know, and then sort of uh, uh, took over landscapes. Uh, uh, and it's quite, quite interesting, actually. So uh, I do see it occasionally now. It, it was much more abundant mm. when I was younger. Very interesting. Um, so uh, yes, so aid stories of aid, you know, also also uh, pan out differently. Uh, there's another question. I don't know how you how you feel about this, but Arun wants to ask you: Plants are now being genetically modified to become disease resistant and tolerant to droughts. Do you think this is going to increase the income of farmers by making farming more productive in an increasingly challenging climate, or would it exacerbate existing social inequalities? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the, the sort of, you know, the, the concluding part of it is probably, uh, probably something you want yes. to take up, but how would you approach, um, you know, sort of the yes. modification of plants, right? Which is something, of course. Yes. Deal with. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's a fantastic question. And it's fantastic for many reasons. First, because it has this, how, what do, why do we modify plants? Hmm. And why do we think we can make better plants? But it's also in, in a second part question, which is the question of climate change and how that's, so I'll take this as a two part question. So um, we as a humans, as a species have constantly been modifying plants. We, when you look at farming for millennia, it was about creating better, by creating parent races, taking them to create a better crop and resistance to disease was actually one of the leading causes that led to the initial hybrid wheats, which are def different than genetically modified wheats. We have been making hybrid plants, uh, graphs of trees and graphs of, uh, for, for millennia. And the idea was to create, in terms of wheat, a species that would be resistant to rust, which mm. could, a uh, rust disease, which could, in many ways, destroy an entire farmer's crop. And it was very difficult to eradicate. So when you had, when you create parent wheat plants who are resistant to rust, the idea was that would save, um, with a hybrid seed, that that would save the farmer's crop. The problem is that mm -hmm. hybrid crops lose their potency after generations. And that means that farmers have to constantly be buying seed. And this is the problem with genetically modified seeds, that they have been tweaked as well so that the potency is lost, forcing farmers to not rely on the seed from previous years, but to continue to purchase seeds. So it has changed the whole process, which I'm sure all of you know, but the whole process of farming in, in many different ways. 
So to get back to the very astute question that was posed in terms of how does that, um, how does the, what are the social implications of the fight for disease? Um, it really depends on how we approach this problem. If it is approached as a business model, where mm -hmm. it is about extraction of capital from farmers because mm -hmm. farmers are concerned with disease, it's, it's not going to be an equitable playing field. But if we approach this problem of farming in general, food provision in general, as one that we on a global scale benefit if farmers have strong livelihoods, mm -hmm. then it's a very different story. So I, I think to answer the question of Russ before I address the... <laughs> by creating rust resistance we also had to create more use of insecticide and pesticide and all these other chemicals which are now dam damaging and have damaged our soils. So it's a very tricky balance in terms of disease is a very particular one because plants, as you know, as all living things get sick and they need, they need care. So where, is the, where are the scales? And in the mid 20th century, the idea was to produce more crops, more yield at whatever cost. And whatever cost, that's what has now created so many of the problems, social problems that we're seeing now. To, so that's a really a non-answer, but it's to say the answer is we need to find a balance when it comes to disease and plants. Now with regard to climate change, again, that's, that's a really interesting question. What do we do? I'm seeing now um, with the farmers in, in Sonora and when I was in Chennai recently with Devnavi, uh, I was able to go to a KVK near Chennai and climate change is a concern throughout this, this uh, for monsoon rains that come or come too long in Mexico, droughts that are taking much too long. And so I'm seeing with the farmers in particular in Mexico that borders the Sonoran Desert, the desert is expanding. So they keep asking scientists to produce different, better, again, that's the word, right? Better seeds that are able to uh, combat the desert uh, heat and the aridity. But they're always a step behind because climate change is now happening so quickly, right? And, and science takes time. So you're now, we're in this vicious cycle where the farmers are in some ways the gatekeepers of what's happening in our food production line, what's happening to our crops, what's happening to our plants. And they're like, science, we need a solution. And we need it fast. But then something else is, is happening. So uh, as the final sentence to, to this person's question, I think we need to really, as a, hum as a global humanity, Think about how climate change is affecting farming because we all need to eat. We all depend on, on how that's changing the, ch the chain of, of supply. Yeah. In fact, Marisha has a question that follows up on exactly that. Uh -huh. She's asking that it's becoming apparent in India now that extensive wheat and rice cultivation um, during the Green Revolution has caused huge water and, I mean, has had huge water and climatic costs, right? And, and soil costs as well. I mean, we have salinity in soil gone up uh, to crazy levels. So she wanted, she wants to know if this is also the case in Mexico and is there a solution being thought of for this? That, Marisha, is, is wonderful. Another wonderful question. So to answer your question, this was known at the beginning. And this is one of the things that has been most shocking about the research that I have been doing because um, scientists knew very early on hmm. that the scientific solutions were, were going to have social implications. But again, we need to put ourselves within the context of when the Green Revolution was happening. It's a Cold War scenario. Who's going to win the race? And Javnavi, as you know, many of these atomic solutions or other scientific solutions, um, it was about getting there fast, regardless of the cost or pushing aside the social cost. Um, so when we talk about the implications for Mexico, it's quite interesting because I, I spoke briefly about the Mexican Revolution but the, and 
it was basically in many ways, many, many revolutions rolled up into one and one was the uprising of the peasants. But if you were to look at the condition of these peasants, of these farmers in the 1950s and 60s, they were very similar to what they had been in the 19th century, sadly. So there were still large estates. So when you have these development of these hybrid seeds, they are developed not for the small farmer, for the mm. subsistence farmer, which is the majority of the world, but these green revolution seeds are developed for commercial farmers, for large estate farmers. And this gets to your question, Marisha, which deals with irrigation, the capital needed for irrigation, capital needed for all these other inputs, fertilizer, pesticides, etc. So in Mexico, what they're now trying to do, there's now this attempt to what they're calling like green, green revolution, like the, these attempts to be more conscious of, um, of a more holistic taking in the environment. And interestingly, bringing up for, to the foreground, the question of gender, because mm -hmm. many of the majority of farmers actually in many places are women. Mm -hmm. And normally when we talk about farming, women issues are not, are not front and center. So Mexico has this current program, it's called Mas Agro, which focus, focuses on women and women farmers. And this, of course, changes frame, the framing of how farming is approached. And it's considered to be, and again, this is a gendered idea, but women as caregivers and, and keepers of the earth, that this is also the keepers, that they will have a better um, uh, understanding of the world. And I'll just say this last thing. Uh, there are attempts, and some have been successful, but n not as fast. There's this question of, of how fast solutions are happening. There's this problem right now in the Sea of Cortez, which is near Sonora. It's been a problem for years. And it's the kelp forests. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't know why the kelp forest would bloom and begin to grow at this. Uh, and there was so much that they were asphyxiating the fish in this very rich ecosystem. And it turned out that it was all the runoff from the farming fields of um, this valley where the Green Revolution begins because of the use of fertilizers, which are high in nitrogen. And all of that was washing into the Sea of Cortez. So, Marisha, to get to your question, to your to answer your question, there are solutions, but there are also age-long problems that are still not being solved, and others that are coming about. So, I keep saying it's a balance, but again, it goes back to this balance. Yeah. which again leads in beautifully into the next question from Siddharth, who wants, who wonders if you could speak a little more to the juxtaposition of indigenous localized agroecologies. Uh -huh. and the universalization of crop varieties that eventually the Green Revolution worked for. But what he's interested in understanding is how, if at all, did this unfold in Kankoji's time and work? Mm. You know, so sort of the, the, you know, in a sense, the lab and the farm, right? Like, uh, yes. So I think, uh, again, thank you for that, that really wonderful question. So I think if we, if we were, so let's look at Kankoji, what he was trying to do, and then put it with what happened. Um, I wrote this article called The Socialist Origins of the Green Revolution because we mm -hmm. tend to think of the Green Revolution as, uh, and it's coming out next month, and uh, we tend to think of the Green Revolution as a capitalist solution. Um, but if we use Kankoje as one of the originators, he was about local knowledge, right? He was about bringing, um, and it was, more than 100 free schools of agriculture, which meant that it wasn't one model. It wasn't one model of education for all. It wasn't one model of farming for all. It was about um, bringing the local needs, local farming needs, but also local cultural understandings of, farmer, of farming. Um, you can't disassociate that. And that was one of the problems with the Green Revolution, which as Siddharth um, no noted, you know, when you have this universal solution, mm. you, the, the problems that were local don't disappear. They just are exacerbated. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to, to get this juxtaposition between local and universal, what if we had followed a model 
like the Mexican agronomist and Cancoje was a part of where they were saying, look, we need to take a look at the histories of struggle of these farmers. We can't mm -hmm. disassociate land tenure issues and water issues from productivity. Imagine if that had been our narrative instead of let's yield more, yeah, let's right. produce more. Then we would have said, well, here in this, in Southern India, we, we have these problems, which are linked to this historical tradition. But in Northern India, because it's a different climate, because again, a different tradition, different religion, different understanding, we have a different panorama of how farming should be approached. What if we had done that? Mm. We would have a much more inclusive understanding of what farming is and its role within society. But we mm. didn't do that, right? We pushed the solution, which was like, this is going to produce more and be great. And farmers need to adapt to this model, not the model adapting to farmers. Yeah. You have, you have an uncanny knack for anticipating the next questions. I mean, not only in terms of extraction, but also, also in terms of ideologies. Our next question is from one of our, in fact, Phytopia uh, program speakers, Emilia Terracciano. Uh, it's great to have you here, Emilia, uh, whose question is, um, his biography, so Kankoj's biography seems to suggest mm -hmm. that both capitalism and revolutionary communism share a common desire to master nature. I mean, if you look at industrial farms of the Soviet Union, for example, yeah. right? and control it for, if not profit, then food sovereignty, right? <laughs> On either side of the fence. So Khan Koje, after all, uh, Emilia says, was both fascinated by communism and the problem of hunger, as well as seeking to, uh, in a way, profit financially from his own initiatives, although he was less, mm -hmm. less successful in the latter project. So uh, how would you, in a way, yeah, how would you answer this? <laughs> so the, the question, if I understood it, is, uh, Kankoje's personal, uh, yes. how he's personally seeking. Well, he was also, this is Emilia, Emilia, thank you for this really interesting question. So I will try to answer with what, how I understand he may have been thinking given the, given the context. Kankoje, by, um, when he's in Mexico, but it's, he are, will already have a family and has to support them. And because of these political turnovers, Kankoje is constantly losing his position because in Mexico, what happens when every six years when there's a new president, he changes all his, all his cabinet, but also at all levels. Hmm. So Kankoje as basically a refugee in Mexico was in a very vulnerable position. And uh, he is, when the Rockefeller Foundation actually goes into Mexico in 1943, Kankoje requests to be employed by them. He, and he's constantly seeking employment because he's getting these very um, short-term employments. So there's Kankoje, uh, the revolutionary, right? And as all humans, he's a complicated individual because you have this revolutionary zeal, which Emilia, as you rightly point out, is you know this uh, endeavor for food sovereignty, hmm. for farmer sovereignty, um, but at the same time, to, to provide a well-being for the farmers. And how can you marry those? And uh, the idea was that you could, if the idea wasn't that you were doing this for profit. But at the same time, he as an individual needs to be making a living. So I, I think for me, how do I uh, bring those two I don't think they're necessarily disparate. I think um, the quest of a farmer to provide better crops is also a quest to have a living, to, to make a comfortable living and to provide more for their family than for the future generation that they did, than they did. Kankoji was involved in a lot of, um, he also was involved in mines, which didn't go well. So it was like mining and all these other sectors. I mean, it really is extraordinary. And it's, it is, of course, for profit because he's trying to make a living in, in a very precarious situation. Thank you, Amelia, for that really, really interesting question. So uh, there's one more question uh, from Mohammed Bhatia. What he wants, what he's interested in is understanding the entry of Bill Gates 
mm. into agronomy and ah. into um, well, effectively using AI and high tech. Um, yes. How is that? Or in a way, do you see signs of a similar kinds of um, uh, similar kind of processes unleashing as the Green Revolution? Um, or what you know in, in effect what does that signal and how do we understand this entry right i mean it, it one thing is of course very clear it's an important problem of the day and hunger it, you know food security and yes. hunger are problems uh, but how does one read his entry into the scene oh From this is history this is, yeah this is an exciting question yes. because if you look it's not sim it's not just bill gates um but it's also howard buffett for example the son of warren buffett who has his main foundation, his organization, is an, a foundation that is devoted to agriculture, but because he was a farmer, a, a lifelong farmer. It, mm, so Warren Buffett and um, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim for a long time were battling who was the richest man in the world, and it's now the Amazon guy. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, for Warren Buffett, he did not give his children money. He wanted them to create their own livelihood. And Howard Buffett became a farmer, a quite successful farmer in, in middle America. And then and less than a decade ago, they each, each of the children received a significant amount of money to create a foundation and devote it to what they thought was the most pressing problem for the globe. Mm -hmm. And for Howard Buffett, it was farming and it was the provision of food. So following along the lines of Bill Gates, who again are embracing science and here is where Mohammed, your question is so exciting to me in many ways there's many similarities with what more with the foundation that howard buffett and uh, with africa and its approach to africa is doing with say the rockefeller foundation mm -hmm. where you have these philanthropic organizations with good intentions <laughs> to to bring a solution and I think one of the things that is different, and I'm hoping for a different solution, is that Howard Buffett himself was a farmer for decades. Mm -hmm. So he understands um, farming and he understands crops and uh, livestock in a different register than, say, the ones who were running uh, the Rockefeller Foundation earlier. Although some of the Rockefeller men uh, also were, they had factories of, of fertilizer, not coincidentally. <laughs> so, um, so to answer your question, I think there are parallels, but I also think we are now more aware mm. of the problems of these one solution for all. And uh, I don't know how far these social so, uh, uh, examinations these socio-historical understandings of society travel up to these uh, ranks. Um, Obama, before he left office, had said that we needed a new green revolution for Africa. And that was set off red alarms. And for those of us, how are you understanding green revolution? You know, how are you understanding it as it was applied in South Asia and East Asia in the mid 20th century? Or is this a new conception? So Mohammed, I think... There are many parallels between these very wealthy individuals attempting to solve problems, but it's how we approach the solution of these problems. Is it going to be, to get back to one of the previous questions, a localized solution that will have more impact in, for the better of the, in, or a universal solution where people on the local, on the ground need to try to fit into this universal solution so that they can get aid, either be it through seeds or mechanized um, farm implements or whatever it may be. So Mohammed, stay in touch because I think right now, <laughs> this, this is going to be yes, one of the it. crucial questions. Who defines how yes. we solve? And, and one final thing, it's how we couch the narrative. If it's a problem of hunger, a problem um, because no one should be hungry in the world. We have enough for everyone. It's hunger, as we all know, is a politically constructed, a socially constructed problem. So how do we frame this problem? Is it going to be a problem of, um, of science? Is it going to be a problem of variety? Is it going to be a problem of yield? We've learned, the, we've seen what happens when we do that. 
I mean, this is this is wonderful. I, I I'd like to ask you one more question, but before I ask that, a comment, um, you know, on on uh, history. Why you know why what some of us do is so incredibly important because not only the history of the foundations and their involvement in diplomacy, in geopolitics, in shaping agricultural practices the world over, you know, with the Rockefeller Foundation and now with various other foundations that are coming in. But also precisely, as you said, the narratives, right? Like how, how when you make it a technocratic narrative of, of more yield, it leads, to, it, it leads to certain paths. And um, when, when you have other narratives, it, leads, it might open up other paths. So the paths not taken are something that, you know, are in yes. the treasure chest that belongs to the historian because, many, because you know, collectively, as humanity, we, we have chosen to forget. And um, it's, it's, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the reason why, I mean, I would urge you, for example, to, you know, to, to maybe write, write and, and say something about, you know, what, what are our alternatives? What are the alternative narratives available to us now, given that we've understood, you know, historically what has happened, right? And I think I'd, I'd love to see something like that come from, uh, come from someone like yourself, who has now deeply understood it across borders too, right? Like, so it's not, it's not about food security in a location, but it's actually about how <laughs> research people, ideas travel across. Uh, so I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us this evening and to, to our audiences for taking the time to be with us and asking what I think were, were wonderful questions. I enjoyed, I enjoyed, you know, bringing them to you, Gabriela, and I, I, I trust you might have enjoyed answering them too. Um, it's uh, please do leave us your feedback, everybody. Um, I, I'd like to end the evening by asking you just one question, Gabriela. Can you give us the names of a couple of agronomists who work with who worked with Panduram Khan Koji? And I'll tell you why, mm -hmm. because it's absolutely delightful to see that you know, uh, as a person as a person you know of Mexican origin, and of course having traveled and worked the world over, and now sitting you know. Mm -hmm at Harvard and Princeton, well, this particular year in Princeton, um, you know, you, you have, you found your way to Khan Koji. I think it would be beautiful if someone working on the agronomy and history of agriculture in India were to find their way to Mexico or to, you know, Ghana or to, you know, somewhere else, yeah. right? And I think it, it would be great to find these stories, to learn, to juxtapose, to contrast. So could you tell us the names of, of a few of them and we'll, we'll share them with our viewers so that you know, it hopefully leads to more curiosity about Mexico. Absolutely. So the first one who comes to mind is Edmundo Tabuada. And I can send you the writing. Um, but Edmundo Tabuada is, is like, when you think about it, agronomists are fascinating individuals. And a Tabuada, um, correct, a Tabu O-A-D-A. And Tabuada. T okay. Yes. Uh, Edmundo Tabuada um, in, is one of the leading geneticists when it comes to plant geneticists in Mexico at this time. But he also, he studies in the United States and travels to the U.S. and Canada. And he comes back and he realizes how important experimental stations are. So he um, eventually works his way up and becomes director of experimental stations in Mexico. And he himself had a really interesting understanding of the role that land tenure had worked with in Mexico. So he tries, he, many of the broken up estates, some of that land becomes part of, becomes experimental stations. But there's also Marte Gomez, uh, Marte like Mars. And, um, and Marte Gomez comes from a completely different microclimate in Mexico. This is the tropical area of Mexico. And he becomes eventually works his way up to become the Minister of Agriculture. And Marte Gomez becomes friends with Cancoche. Very, very, and he employ, he's the one who offers him employment. So, uh, and Marte Gomez, curiously enough, is one of the founders of the Bank for Farmers. So there's a little bit of complications which gets, which gets back to um, Emilia's question, because you, why is one of these proponents for farming suddenly on the board of bankers um, as an agronomist himself? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think who else would have been a contemporary. Uh, other names fail me at the moment, but I can send them to you because there are literally dozens. 
uh, at I this moment. I can imagine. But I, I would be happy to send them to you and then we can, uh, you can hopefully send them on to, to folks. Absolutely. We'll do that and we'll, we'll, we'll list them up, uh, you know, where, where we um, uh, have your, um, have your talk next to Khan Koje, the exhibit on Khan Koje uh, produced by Savit Sony. You know, as soon as I hang up, there's 15 that are going to come out of my mouth because <laughs> of my apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriela. It was a it was an absolute pleasure to have you speak to us and um, also give us the time to pick your brains on the many questions that we had. Thank you again to the audience to uh, have taken the time to spend with us on a Saturday evening, and we look forward to the next full week of Phytopia and fun with plants. And to Gabriela, thanks again. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>